So today's talk is by Anna Makarutsu from Zimbabwe, um, who is active in the Python community in Zimbabwe, um, the involved in PySim, the um, Zimbabwean Python community. She also organizes Django Girls and is involved in the organization of PyCon Zimbabwe this year. And without further ado, here is Anna. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank PyCons uh, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, the journey that we have had uh, in setting up an uh, open source uh, community in Zimbabwe. So before I start, I'll just give a bit of background of, uh, about myself. I'm an ICT consultant uh, and also a Python Django developer. I've been, uh, for the first five years of my life, I was a career nomad changing jobs, so I've done a bit of everything in the IT field. I've worked for a university, worked in the telecoms industry, yeah, and um, also done some consulting. Then, um, currently, I'm self-employed uh, through my company. I'm also a Django Girls uh, organizer, as well as a Python Zim organizer. So these days, I juggle between um, open source uh, community activities and also trying to set up my own business. So that's about me. So how it all started. Um, in 2013, I was uh, consulting in a project uh, in Mozambique. It was uh, for a telecoms billing and CRM system. So one of the challenges that I saw in that project was we had a developer coming from uh, China, developing a system uh, in Mozambique. And then we were sort of like middlemen uh, uh, giving help. Um, in project management. So we're defining the process uh, for the system. But what ended up happening was, uh, while they could implement the billing side, the CRIM uh, didn't come out right because uh, the, of uh, the analytics part. So I realized that I, I, I had a skills gap, so I needed to get back into programming again. And I uh, was looking for a data science language. So. After finishing my master's in 2014, I, uh, 20, early 2015, there was an advert by Muzinda Hub. Uh, it's a subsidiary of Econet Wireless, which is offering a scholarship to learn a digital skills program. So one of the languages that they were offering was Python, and I didn't know about it and Googled more. Then I realized that it's a general purpose language also, but it's also famous for its data science. So that's how I ended up uh, enrolling for the Muzinda Hub scholarship. And we learned uh, Python through e-learning uh, with the Treehouse uh, site. So we were after, do, after learning for your, doing your track for three months, you were expected to do your uh, project to showcase what you had learned. So uh, what happened was we did the track, learn Python. But after we were done, you were, we didn't know how to use Python. So I had to learn Flask uh, with other colleagues, uh, also with Ronald and Humphrey. That's how we all met up, and uh, some were learning Django. So we decided to help each other So with our project. project. So that's when we had our first meeting, and we were four members uh, in that meeting. Uh, Ronald, Humphrey, and another lady, Pretty, who is not here. So after that, we decided to set up uh, a Python user group uh, we, which would share, meet and share knowledge uh, on Python programming uh, during that day. So after trying to set up uh, uh, PyCon, we faced some challenges. First, uh, we tried to get more people who were in our class to join uh, the Python user group. So we, we thought it would be the first meetup meet was successful. We talked mainly about projects. Then as we went along uh, and involved more people, we realized that the meetings that we, we were having now were now more uh, of bureaucracy because uh, there was a conflict of interest. While we were thinking of just sharing uh, information and knowledge, people were actually thinking, okay, so we can actually start a company, you know, a business venture, and uh, we make money. So, you know, the moment, uh, you know, <laughs> people start thinking about money, People are arguing, well, okay, who well, would we'll, uh, we'll, watch position? The next time you meet again, you think you're going to have another meetup and we discuss something. People again are arguing about what, what happened last time. And uh, 
So nothing uh, seemed like to be happening for the next uh, few months because we, there were only a few committed people we were actually willing to work for the community to make things happen. The rest of the people, they would just come and you discuss positions. The next time, when you meet, uh, how far with the PI uh, Zim website, it hasn't been done. And uh, every time you meet, you are, they are actually you have other people coming in. So you have to go through uh, what you already had discussed. We want a website, uh, but you don't see the website being developed. So it's... Um, it took time for us to then say uh, we are doing something. And also, when we tried to uh, propose meetups, people like when we meet, they say we should meet uh, tw uh, at least twice a, a month. They don't say, oh, come on, uh, it's not practical because uh, most people would think uh, about past fair because most of the people in the groups then they were not working. So. When you think about uh, meeting twice a month, so you're actually thinking if you are meeting outside town, I'll need uh, $2 transport for just to meet up. So we didn't actually have uh, many successful meetups because of that. People were thinking how we can make money when you're thinking of sharing information and people don't have money to actually come for those meetups. So uh, the other thing was we, actually, we wanted to register an association uh, but we couldn't also because when you get to the part where people are supposed to volunteer and at least sacrifice something to just get uh, the association registered, people are not also committed, not just because they don't want also, but because they don't have the money. So uh, it, it was a bit difficult for us. And uh, it's not only because people were not committed. The other, there are more underlying factors for this, like, if we wanted to approach any organization uh, in Zim for support, the challenge that we have is uh, most companies or individuals who are using open source software, they are using mostly PHP and Linux. And Python is uh, a new language in Zimbabwe. I think the, the companies are starting to use Python now. I can say for like Econet, it's now trying to move from Java to Python, but all along Python hasn't been used. And also, it uh, just back to the fact that uh, Python is not really taught in universities in Zimbabwe. So for now, I only know of University of Zimbabwe uh, teaching Python. When we are doing uh, Django Girls Machingo, the lecturer uh, actually told us they are using, they are still using C to introduce students to programming. So you are trying to start a community for, uh, where uh, the, the language actually is not known. Uh, in Zimbabwe, and the moment you ask, tell people that we are trying to, could you sponsor us, we are working on something, uh, on the Python community, they'll ask you what is Python, because Python is not known. Then the other thing that we also, that also caused uh, this problem is, normally in Zimbabwe, people make money by what they know. So people don't share information. If, uh, for example, uh, if I know that uh, some, uh, something is being sold for 20 cents in a shop, I can actually buy that, uh, I can buy lots of uh, goodies from the shop uh, that's selling them for 20 cents. Then I just go out and I, I set up my stand and I'm selling for 50 cents and I make profit. And because people's, uh, people are just passing by, they don't know that what I'm actually selling is that is cheaper in that shop they'll buy. So because we are actually uh, you make used to making money from uh, others by what we know, it's also true even in the IT sector, if I, if I develop uh, a website for you, because most people in Zimbabwe are not that computer literate, so they don't know how to, you can actually register your own domain online, have it hosted, whether it's South Africa or United States in, from uh, Zimbabwe, you pay online. Most people are not, uh, don't know about that. So you can actually make money just by saying, okay, uh, domain registration will cost, cost you $50, you know I can, you are registering for $10, then for the hosting, you need another 150 for, for the whole year. But you know you are actually paying, if uh, it's expensive, it most probably you are just paying $60 a, for the whole year for that site. Otherwise, probably you have got a account which you pay probably maybe 120 or 160 to host an unlimited domains. So after, de uh, after de uh, developing the website, they will not show their clients that they can actually maintain their own site. 
So whenever they want a new email, they have to call that person. They charge them $20 for support. Whenever they want to delete another email account, they'll, they'll call that person again, the IT person, and they charge them $20 for support. So now setting up a community to say, okay, you are coming, we meet up uh, somebody, volunteers to buy, uh, to buy drinks, like we did for the first meeting, and uh, you are not getting paid for it, you just tell me what you know. You know, people are, are realizing, okay, I'll be losing money here. How can I do something that doesn't benefit me financially? So that, uh, that uh, background also makes it difficult for, made it difficult for us to actually start a community where people can just meet and, you know, uh, exchange information and, um, you know, help each other. Then the other thing is uh, we are not used to subscribing to professional bodies. Like, we have the Computer Society of Zimbabwe but I can just get hired in Zimbabwe without being a member of that society. So, given the economic hardships, why should I subscribe? Maybe if I pay $5 a month just to be a member of the Computer Society of Zimbabwe, if it doesn't help me in any way. So, telling people now, if you are setting up a society, you have to subscribe and pay something. People will just think it's a waste of money because they don't see the benefit they will derive from that. So, it also made it uh, difficult for us then the other thing is we currently have a high unemployment rate in Zimbabwe, especially amongst the youth. And uh, our labor laws uh, changed uh, sometime last year uh, to what normally, what, what was there was uh, if a company can, is failing to pay me, they cannot let me go unless they retrench me. So because the government also had... Um, a lot of uh, employees which they were failing to pay. Then the parastatals as well, a lot of employees which they were failing pay, to pay. There was a bill which uh, allowed employers to just to give three months notice to people and then they sent them home. So that resulted in, uh, when it happened, you'd have like something like maybe 3,000 people being fired one day. Then the next you, re you realize uh, 6,000 people have been laid back and sent home. So because of that, most people are unemployed, and we, so an association which will ask them to pay money is something that they cannot be a member of. One, two, because of that, everyone is an entrepreneur. They are actually either buying and selling uh, for women or uh, software piracy for men. So if you are going to be telling people how to do things, uh, especially when it comes to using software, then that's a threat to livelihood. So. That also made it difficult for us to establish a uh, PISIM. But while it seemed uh, that setting PISIM seemed a failure, uh, we were having no meetups, no resolutions being actioned, and uh, no registrations. It's, it was imperative that we wanted to, we had to do, to set up PISIM. Because this is uh, the current situation in Zimbabwe. As you can see, people, uh, women are selling drinks. Then the young men that you see, they are flashing uh, phones, unlocking. They are doing music piracy and installing WhatsApp on phones. So people, are, they have laptops, but this is what they are using those laptops to, to do. They have no, nothing else that they can use them to do. So this is the situation that is currently in Zimbabwe. That is facing us despite the challenges that we, were, uh, that we faced in setting uh, PISIM. So from the picture that you've seen, uh, it's needful for us to empower uh, women by introducing them to programming to create other opportunities for employment, as well as um, entrepreneurship. And also it's needful for us to introduce young uh, people, especially the men, to programming so that they can make a livelihood through software, software and they don't have to make uh, a livelihood through software and music files. So how are we going to do that? We started organizing uh, open source events in Zimbabwe. So since uh, December 2015, the goal has, to be, has been to organize the first Python conference in Zimbabwe this year, uh, PyCon Zimbabwe, and then a uh, Django Girls Zarare event. So the major challenge that we faced was we had no experience uh, with organizing um, PyCon or Django Girls events. So it's, it's a dream that we had. We hadn't actually been to one PyCon or to any Django Girls event, but we wanted to do that in Zimbabwe. 
So we, get the, we got an opportunity to experience uh, PyCon Namibia 2016 and Django Girls Vindog. So in uh, January this year, we got an opportunity to attend and speak at the conference. Uh, only two members managed to go, that's Humphrey and I. And then uh, we also got the opportunity to coach at Django Girls Vindog. So it was uh, funded by, PyCon, uh, by the Django Society of UK in an uh, opportunity that we really appreciated. And during that uh, conference, not only did we get the chance to meet and uh, to speak, but we also got a chance to meet uh, friends and um, colleagues who have been very instrumental in the work that we then managed to do uh, after the conference. Then uh, with the help of uh, Helen Taylor, uh, she's uh, based in UK, we managed to organize uh, Django Girls Harare, which took place on the 9th of April. And in this workshop, uh, 26 girls and women at, who attended the uh, age between 8 and 60 years. And it was a successful uh, event. However, with the challenges that we faced with this uh, event was that uh, we had uh, serious issues uh, marketing the event. We hadn't organized an event before, so we thought we could just do the Twitter and Facebook which didn't work uh, for us because most people in Zimbabwe are not that active on Twitter. We managed to do an, a newspaper, a newspaper article which uh, helped uh, get more applications, but then on the day uh, it rained uh, heavily, so m some of the applicants didn't show up. Then uh, while, uh, during the time that we were organizing um, Jungle Girls Harare, we had uh, a, uh, a couple uh, who pulled out their uh, children from the event because they had visited uh, the Django Girls uh, Harare website and they saw the picture of uh, Aisha Bello wearing a t-shirt with a python snake. So this is actually an actual snake and in Zimbabwe, snakes are actually associated with uh, juju and satanism. So and one of the uh, ladies who had their story uh, on, on Django Girls also had a tattoo. So they were worried, uh, what am I getting my girls involved in? So they actually... Oh, had to pull out their uh, children, but it was successful. Then after that, we also got an opportunity to publish a blog uh, on the Jungle Girls website. Sorry. And I also got to publish my story on the Jungle Girls website, which helped me uh, build up my profile and also got the opportunity to uh, mentor ladies. Then after that, we also managed to organize a uh, Django Girls Mashingo on the 24th of September, which was a success. Uh, then with this, uh, we had uh, challenging issues. Um, first, the internet, which is, uh, internet issues, which I talked about in the uh, discussion earlier on. Then we had uh, funding issues on the, uh, uh, because of sanctions against Zimbabwe. So we couldn't get uh, help from the Python Software Foundation. So this actually helped us in that, uh, or the friends that we met in um, Namibia helped us set out a crowdfunding project for PyZim. And we managed to be overfunded for the money that we had asked for. So PyCon Zimbabwe is now possible because of the friends that we made in uh, Namibia. And also some opportunities that came up because we had been contributing to uh, the Django community, though without doing our code contributions, we also got nominated to join the Django Software membership, which, also, which is not a mandatory benefit, but uh, it also helped us to get access to more influential members in the Django community for funding for our events. So the important lessons that I've learned about this is that it's not always about the money. Sometimes you, get, you can get benefits which are not necessarily monetary which you cannot touch, but you actually have done something. Then whenever you are planning uh, an event, it's not about the elegance, but you have to see if you have met the objective. And the objective is, if it's uh, introducing women to Python programming, if they learned, then I've also learned that exposure and networks are far more important than the money. Then sometimes it's important to know whom you are working with. Uh, if they are not committed, you don't have to push them around. Just work with a few numbers that are 
uh, more uh, committed and worry about commitment and results, not the number of people you are working with, then sometimes you need to think outside the box. If you have no internet, you might need to use uh, hard copy forms to get applications. Then remember also you are in Africa, so don't uh, act like you are in Europe. Organize an event looking at the area that you are uh, working with. And then I also learned that I can make a difference and that Django Girls is really a noble idea. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Questions, come on. Um, so what motivates young people to want to learn programming and to come to these conferences, like for, for Django Girls, like what has your, been your experience? Okay. Um, I think for us in Zimbabwe, the main push right now is uh, people are unemployed and there is nothing really to do. So if they can learn something that will be beneficial for them in the long run, it's better than just being uh, seated at home. That's one thing. Then the other thing is uh, for the young people, they are just interested in learning new stuff because they find um, technology more interesting. Then the, all the attendees that we had, um, some of them is because it's a requirement for their job and they have nowhere else to, to learn. We've got a lecturer at UZ who is required to be working with Linux and uh, Python, but she has been looking for somewhere to learn Python in Zimbabwe for a long time and not finding uh, the place. So we are kind of uh, providing uh, an opportunity to people which they wouldn't find elsewhere in Zimbabwe. More questions? More questions. Uh, so now that you managed to get some funding for PyCon Zim, when is that happening? Okay. Um, 24th to 25th November 2016. Um, it's a such training center in Belvedere, Harare. Questions? Hi. Um, I've got a question to do with the piracy issue that you mentioned to do with the men, particularly in Zim. I wanted to find out with your experience with uh, Django Girls and what you've been working on. Have you had the same issues in terms of people looking more to that avenue for um, you know, in terms of economics, um, after learning um, Django, or is our women a little bit better when it comes to issues of piracy? They don't get involved with that. Okay, uh, the ladies that we have uh, uh, taught programming, uh, it's not everyone who then uh, continues, but some of them they're actually using Python and Django to. Uh, they are still learning because it's a learning process. You don't attend one day and you're already a superhero, but they are still interested in learning. But what we realized is, especially when we were planning the Django Girls uh, Mashingo, uh, we, we kept being asked this question about uh, Django boys. So we have got actually a lot of young men who, who are interested in attending uh, a PyCon Zim because uh, it would then accommodate them. So there are actually people interested in learning Python. Um. If, if internet is a problem, okay, so if I have a, a problem in programming and I want to solve it, I always Google, how do you do this? And then I work from there. So how do you have any resources which you give the people to help them when they're moving on with their own projects? Uh, do you have solutions for that if you don't have internet? Uh, okay. Uh, the good thing about Jungle Girls, um, manual which you have been using so far is you can actually have an offline copy. So for the purpose of uh, learning, somebody can use uh, the offline copy. Then we also encourage them uh, to join um, uh, our Python mailing list as well as uh, so that they, and as well as Google. Because what uh, the main ch major challenge is um, when, if you don't know the need for having internet, you might not uh, see uh, the need to have internet at home or to use Google on your, uh, on your smartphone because most of the people, they do have smartphones, but uh, they don't have internet at home. So the moment you are introduced to Django Girls and you start coding, you realize that uh, 
I can actually get help on the internet. That actually encourages more people to spend more time on the internet because uh, the reason why people are not uh, coding with Python or don't know about these opportunities is that they don't have internet because they don't see the need for it. So Django Girls uh, tutorial introduces uh, people to internet, the internet as well and how it works. So it then helps people to, uh, to it helps, then helps to expose people to the internet and how much they can do with it. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is just linked to the economic situation. Um, have you guys looked at viable models of how you can um, help people through programming? So I'm thinking of things like Odisk or Freelancer and um, maybe pointing people to that direction, saying like if you're not program, at least you can get jobs online because with programming, you're not limited to the proximity or wherever you are. Uh, we always do that in our welcome remarks for Django Girls uh, workshops. Then also when we are explaining to applicants why they should attend Django Girls or why should they apply, we also tell them that uh, learning Python and Django will give you the opportunity to be able to apply to jobs, uh, remote jobs, for which you can work uh, while you are in Zimbabwe, you work for a company in Europe or in Asia or here in Africa, but you don't really have to relocate. So we are using that um, the issue of remote jobs as a marketing tool for Django Girls and PyCon Sim. Oh, one more question. Two more questions. Two more questions, and then it's break time. Uh, hi, Anna. Thank hi. you very much for the talk. I could relate to some of the things that you are talking about, especially um, getting people who just want to work, who don't really have money in their mind, you know? Um, but my concern was the, the logo, um, the orange thing. It looks more like a snake, and you said that that's related to Juju. <laughs> so will that not be a problem in, in, in for, for your conference, I guess? Okay. Uh, <laughs> we do have another logo, uh, mo a modified um, PSF logo, but it's just the same flag. I think we can change to that, especially if it's going to cause commotion. <laughs> right, thanks for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, did you sort out the conflict that was there in the initial setup? Or did you kind of like handpick the people who were doing PyCon for the right reasons and then just sort of branched off on your own and left those money hungry people out? Or how did you solve that situation? Okay, uh, what happened after Django Girls Harare was a success, uh, some of the people we, we had as coaches, they started organizing uh, other workshops. Because we were busy, okay, uh, running around with PyCon Zim and Django Girls Mashingo, we couldn't then work with them. So it kind of did itself automatically. We didn't really push them around. But what we did is we kept them in touch and told them about Django Girls Mashingo. They didn't show the interest. So we said, okay, we will work with those who are willing to work. So uh, for the Jungle Girls Machine, we had about seven coaches whom we are work also working with uh, organizing PyCon team. So some, we didn't then say, okay, you are no longer part of us. They are still part of us. We are um, together on WhatsApp groups, on Google groups. But uh, for the organizing part, we thought it's better to work with people who are committed to do the work before the event than people who, are, who just want to post for pictures when the event is successful. Hello? Yes. Um, so it is now coffee time. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. If you have more questions for Anna, you can ask, the, ask her in the coffee venue. Thank you. Thank you.